to Nature Revisited. I have been familiar with the works of Dan Snow ever since the publication of his first book, In the Company of Stone, in 2001. Dan has been carrying on the traditions of dry stone building in southern Vermont for decades. As a gardener, I have always tried to incorporate stone into my garden, and it seems to me that when one builds something of stone and adds it to the landscape, one creates a deeper connection to nature. And few do that better than Dan Snow. This fall, I joined Dan at the Stone Trust in Dummerston, Vermont, to talk about stone, his work, and the Stone Trust. to start with your growing up in southern Vermont. Try to talk a little bit about how those early years really affected you, influenced you, and brought you to stone. Sure. I don't think the time I spent outdoors as a kid was a conscious understanding of the impact it had on me. It was just play, lots of play outdoors. We lived in a neighborhood that was very three-dimensional, lots of ledges and cliffs and hollows and boulders, woods. So just being a kid with other kids, making up games, being able to call the outdoors our play place really was what got me to a point where I felt comfortable that that was my home. Never thought too much about where I would wind up. Having been born here, grew up here, I uh, went to college in New York City and thought, well, this is where I start figuring out where I'm going to go in my life because I wanted to make art. And it wasn't long before I realized that the scene of the city really wasn't mine and just naturally came home needing to find a way to make a living here, doing something that I had done summers through school, which was uh, construction. Slowly eliminated the things that I didn't like about doing construction and eventually came up with the only thing that was left, which was <laughs> building with dry stone. Through books that I realized there was a bigger world of stone and walling and creating things with stone, of course, just there's millennia of examples. So when I started thinking about where I wanted to go to see more of what can be done with it, I was lucky enough to be invited by a diker, which is what a waller would be called in Scotland, to come to him and uh, work with him for a summer. That was in 86 which was eight years after I'd started building walls. And I figured that that would be a pretty good way for me to broaden my understanding. And it certainly did propel it in a direction that felt more professional, more uh, focused on the craft and on structure. I really was just building intuitively to start with just by seeing what was in front of me in terms of existing work. Often what I was doing was rebuilding walls around here anyway, so it meant what had fallen down, I got to see why it fell down and then try and put it back so it wouldn't again. And being able to go to Scotland for a summer and work there on a number of different projects gave me a lot more appreciation for the depth of the craft through history and also really got me thinking, well, there's a lot more I can do with it too. I really look for spots in any commission I got that was practical to find things to do that were playful within them. And slowly that's developed to the point where if I'm lucky, I get to just make playful structures. 
Okay, let's stay in Scotland for a little while. Talk a little bit about the significance, kind of the history of this. Well, if you talk about humans and nature, you could say that dry stone became important after people had cut all the trees down. Because both in Scotland and here in the Northeast US, it wasn't until people had used up the resource of easily accessible wood to make houses, to make fences, that they said, okay, what's next? And uh, stone became what was next. So they were able to recognize the value both in something that's durable in using dry stone for fencing, specifically around uh, pasturing sheep, and also its longevity, that they could put up a wall with stone and not expect to have to repair it or replace it for as much as 100 years if it's well built to start with. Here we are now in a, an environment that has remnants of a whole lot of stone walls in New England specifically, but really in a lot of parts of the US. And the reason they are built is no longer uh, here. It's not even clear why they are in a lot of places because now we look at them and we see them in the woods. So those woods that were originally cleared to have the pasturing that required some fencing like wood and then stone have uh, in large part regrown into forest. So the stone walls we have now, their very importance has gone away with the regrowth of the trees. We don't see the walls now as having the significance that they once did. Dry stone walls are old forms full of new ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Can you elaborate? Oh, well, probably what people associate dry stone walls with is fences, old fences. So knowing that that is really just a representation of, of a type of building, then you can say, well, let's just take that type of building and see what else we can build. I'm really always looking for new forms, new spaces that I can create using stone. And it doesn't have to be strictly a wall, in fact, more and more of the things I build are using the principles of wall building, but the final pieces have more to do with the creation of an environment, of a space in the land. So the thing that people would come away with, I would hope, is more place they can go and find themselves questioning, uh, having curiosity about that specific place, and then as it relates to its wider environment, the longer a work is in place, the more it becomes absorbed by the surroundings. You could say it's finding its way back into nature. The stones become useful in different ways when they're assembled in different ways. The north side of a wall suddenly becomes a cooler environment which invites different kinds of plants than, say, the south side. But they do do something to us when we look at them. What do you think that is, That, if you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. What is that aesthetic value that that wall has? I know what I see anyway. So there's something about the material, I think, that engenders that response and question of why is this something unusual or deeply seated. And for me, I don't, I don't know that it is any more than leaning up against an oak tree. That in terms of its value to me as an element in my environment, it's one more interesting thing. Uh, I happen to have a specific reason often to examine stone, but to have it in my life, it's more about the variety of the environment. And if there's a lot going on, I feel enriched by it. 
if I see uh, a lot of animals, a lot of birds, I really enjoy bird song. That fills up my mind uh, if I'm working outdoors and there's bird activity. That's, to me, plenty of input for me. So it's, it's kind of about simple things that are nature-based and how the more there are of them, the richer the experience of being outdoors is. I think all I've ever wanted to do is make things. Part of what I, I'm trying to get at it is that how important these relationships are that we have both in, in our pastime but in our work. These take us someplace that's important, that is, that is beyond even where we are. What is the nature of your relationship to stone? that you've been doing this for so long, that there's a reason besides just building. There's a method to your madness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know about your madness. Uh -huh. I think it's the contrast between war and peace in that the work of building a stone structure, it's pure labor, it's a struggle. Uh, no one gets out of it without some aches and pains. The payback, that comes from it is peace. At least I feel like when I'm involved in the process to the extent that the only thing that I'm aware of is what happens in finding and placing stones, that I'm at peace. And I don't know other places in my life that I feel that peaceful. Did you sense that from the beginning with working with stone? Well, it probably is the same feeling that I've always had sitting down and drawing, painting. I guess it's the, uh, for me, the individual aspect of it that I'm on my own and it's up to me to make it be something, both physically and also, I guess, spiritually in that it's enough to struggle with a stone. So the idea that I can use that effort to find a place of peace, then I feel like I've, I've had some success. I think it's less about individual stones and more about finding a community of stones that I can bring together and be happy in their relationships. But it's not enough for a waller it's more about what they can produce through the materials that they have at hand. I'm more interested in what those shapes can do as a, a unit. I might, in simple process of building a course uh, on a wall, think more in terms of like dipping a brush into a bucket of paint. I'm dipping my mind into a pile and saying, okay, probably these three or four will go in next in some manner, and then moving them into place. So it's a little less about anything that an individual stone looks like, but more what it will look like in some relationship to the ones that are on each side of it. So how close to nature does working with stone take you? I guess it covers some number of millions of years because any one of these stones has been in its current form probably for a few thousand years and it's been part of some other geologic form for millions of years. So if we're really talking about the range of nature on Earth, then there's no better representative of that than stone. You say the body is the one irreplaceable tool a waller has. Hammer, level, and strings are all important basic tools. Definitely the, the most versatile tool is the builder's body because it's a lifting device, shifting device. It is what is making the determination about the placement of a stone through the eyes, through the feel, really touches the, the strongest tool that a waller has. It's not just what you can see. Often it's the lifting of a stone will tell where its center of gravity is 
and when it is placed on a wall, that center of gravity is now in relation to other stones and the rest of the wall. So that is an important understanding to have when that stone is chosen and placed. Just where is its center of gravity, where that will move to if left to its own devices. I think what matters to me has been changing over time where I felt very strongly about the specifics of the craft for a long time and trying to adhere to rules that have developed both through the Drystone Walling Association of Great Britain, which I've been involved with, and what the Stone Trust does in terms of instructing people in good building methods. But now I feel that because I've trained myself well enough to accomplish that, that that, in a sense, now a second nature. I don't have to think too much about the rules. And in fact, I can bend them a little and break them a little knowing how far I can go and, and still do what I need to do structurally. So I, I find I'm very much interested in how the things I do both have uh, interests for other people and also how they react to things that I'm doing. And if possible, to include people in the manufacture of, of the work, mostly in terms of young people and just how I can think about making projects that there is an element of it that physically engages young people in its creation. It's pretty easy to see how once something's done that viewers and visitors to a site would make their own way with it and find what is meaningful to them. So more of a challenge for me now is to say, well, is there something in this process that I can invite others to be involved with that even without any training, uh, without having specific skills, I can funnel them into a situation where they have a little success, they feel like they're part of something that when it's done, they can come back to it and say, oh yeah, I was here and I helped make it. I'm looking for those kind of opportunities now more. So I, I just get a real kick out of seeing what young people do in their world and relating to it. And if I can have a little influence on that, I feel like I'm doing a little more than I've done before. So you would encourage people, particularly young people, to take up the trait of working with stone? It's not for everybody. But those that do want to spend their time, especially um, in the outdoors, it's almost all dry stone walling work is done outdoors, and who want to use their hands uh, and really their whole bodies in a pursuit. Yeah, I think it's a, especially for young people that have a lot of energy to spend. It's something that is more than just play in that you're in a relationship with your wider environment and some very specific members of that environment, which are a collection of stones that are all different. It's almost like uh, being in a group of people and no two are alike, and you have to try and figure out a little bit about each one of them. Did you start Stone Trust? Myself and uh, three or four other people uh, started the Stone Trust almost 10 years ago now. Uh, this is an organization that is composed of many individuals. So people can come to the Stone Trust simply to observe the works that are here. Mostly it's an education facility in that people can learn about dry stone walling as it is a way of employing loose stone in the environment. Also to be able to improve on their own skills if they're trying to become more than just uh, casually acquainted with it. Generally speaking, it's an organization that is in place to train people either here in Dummerston, where there are walls that 
are taken down and put back up specifically for different kinds of workshops that are done. There's a lot going on now that it's expanded tremendously. It's, it's really fantastic what's been going on in that a lot of people are now recognizing it as the place to go if you want to learn the craft and also just spend a great weekend with a lot of other wonderful people outside wrestling with stone. But I really feel like people are recognizing it as an excellent way in a concentrated period of time to gain a lot of skill. People come away from these two-day workshops really up their game. And also meeting some other really good folks who enjoy the same things. Just getting outdoors, being involved with nature and their environment, uh, and just, just sharing that love. Something that I'm very happy to see as a result of the activity at the Stone Trust is the broadening of the individuals who want to get involved in it, specifically women. There are now workshops that are taught by women and uh, all the women are participants. And just to have that kind of a venue available is such a leap in terms of what has been commonly perceived as a trade that men do. It's not a men's trade, it's a people's trade. It's the activity that anyone who's willing to be involved in nature, in the outdoors, in working with natural materials, can do and can enjoy and become proficient. And in fact, they can take it to complete professional level. Dan Stone. If you would like to see some of the wonderful works and learn more about Dan, I suggest his two books, In the Company of Stone and Listening to Stone. Also, visit Dan's website, dansnowstoneworks.com. If you would like to learn more about the Stone Trust, visit thestonetrust.org. If you enjoyed this episode of Nature Revisited, please share with family, friends, and colleagues. The music for this episode is performed by Martin Decato. You can learn more about him and his music at decatosanbornmusic.com. Nature Revisited is produced by Stefan Van Orden and Charles Gagan. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube do hope you will join us for the next edition of Nature Revisited. And until then, please remember, we are nature. Nature.